Welcome to another Global Liberty Alliance podcast. This is your host, Jason Poblet, coming to you as always across the river from Washington, D.C. in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia. Today, we're going to talk about justice and accountability. And we have a very special guest who is not only a human rights activist, but she's also a, uh, at one point, she was a victim and somebody who has turned that energy, her and her family have been persecuted for many, many years by uh, the Iran and has turned that into a, a crusade of sorts uh, to hold bad actors to account. Um, she's also the sister of one of the thousands who were uh, victimized and tortured and brutally killed by uh, the Iranian regime during the 1998 massacre. And we're going to talk a little bit about the 1988 massacre in one moment. So first of all, let's welcome Baldan Barzagan uh, to the podcast. Welcome. How are you? Thank you for having me. And thank you for listeners uh, to listen to my story and my brother's story. Well, it's, it's a powerful one. And uh, we're glad you could take some time from your busy schedule to uh, share it with us, especially on on this Independence Day weekend, um, as we head into uh, uh, a time of the year where we celebrate the founding of the Republic and all the good things America stands for. And despite our many challenges here, we were still united and working through our problems. And you know, you're, you come from an interesting background. You're in, Cal you're in California now, but your journey to America, um, it's a fascinating one. And I, if, if it's one that I think our listeners would enjoy learning more about. So before we talk about the 88 massacre, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you, how did you, how did you arrive at, uh, at our shores here and, and what happened that you became so engaged in this, uh, in this battle? Because it's been a lifelong battle for you and your family. Yes, uh, my father was a teacher and he owned uh, a chain of private schools with some other people. And for him, education was always the main thing. And I have older brothers and sisters that uh, two of them were studying in America and my brother Bijan, who was later killed, he was studying in England. So after the revolution, Bijan came back, but the other two still were in America. And because I was, since very young, I was always active in the political arena. I was nine when the revolution happened. And since day one, I was involved. I was going to the protests and stuff. And when I was 16, I was arrested for my activities against the Islamic regime. And I spent three and a half months in solitary confinement. So they have been in prison and I was released on the conditional, uh, I got three years prison term conditional. And for four months, I wasn't allowed to go back to school. And for three years, I couldn't leave the country. So anyhow, finally, when I got my diploma, there was no way they would allow me to go to the university. So I went to Italy. It was very difficult for Iranian women to leave the country at that point. Other countries wouldn't allow Iranians to come because they wanted to please uh, Iran's government. Italy had a specific program that if you knew some language, you could go there and enter the university. So I went to Italy. I stayed there for three years. I hated it. So I used the opportunity that I had brother and sister here in America. I got a student visa, came here, started school, and the rest is history. Here I am. Wow. So, years so, later. Okay. So, so I'm just curious. I'm why did you not like Italy? Uh, folks love Italy, the food, the people. <laughs> what was it about? It? <laughs> what, what was it about Italy that said, I'm out of here? Too small for me. You know, Tehran had some <laughs> inhabitants. I was in a city with 30,000 inhabitants that, you know, I, I was feeling suffocated in there. Yeah, I hear. No, I understand. I understand. So especially after coming out of Iran. I mean, it's a totally different uh, lifestyle and, and it, it's, you felt more home in America. That's for sure. And uh, that's, we're, we're glad you came over here. Going back before before we jump into the more current events, you I, I recall that some of the work you were doing as a student at a very young age, eventually you were protesting. Uh, you joined fellow Iranians protesting elections. You, you uh, how did that? You know, for those of us who only lived the revolution through television, and and through our friends who are Iranians, I mean, what was it like to be? inside there and be protesting those type of issues from within a place like Iran? Um, every, every era was different. Mm -hmm. When we were protesting against, against Shah, so of course the brutalities was less during the protest. I mean, before the regime, Shah was also brutal and would 
uh, suppress people, but because the protests were big numbers and people were coming and also the soldiers would refuse to uh, directly shoot at people. So it wasn't very bloody except a few of the protests. It wasn't mm -hmm. very bloody. But after that, uh, the problem was that, uh, you know, I guess because of the cultural reasons or for the uh, for the intimidation, I guess it happens after every revolution, you know, people come to the streets, they scream, and then they get tired, they just go home and mm. uh, allow another person dictate to them what to do. So during the school and stuff, I felt really lonely. I, I would run a newspaper on my school, you know, where I was writing things about it. So I was always a target for right. the moral police that were put in the schools. And every day we were entering the school, they were searching our bags, they were looking what we have. Uh, stuff like that. So it was a very difficult during my teenage, teenager year, it was very difficult to do protests and say anything against the government. And actually, that's one of the reasons that I was arrested because of all of that. Um, and but, you, were, you, you were like a teenager back then. Yes, I was, a, I was a teenager and I couldn't, especially the war was bothering me a lot. Eight years of war is not something easy that a population can go through. Yeah, the war with actually, Iraq. Yeah, the, the war with Iraq, yeah. that was the reason they were able to suppress us and not give us the democracy that we wanted because now our borders were in danger, right? So the, right. the war unified us to fight for our land. But after, after eight years, you would see that, you know, like where I lived, all the streets were numbered, right? They were uh, odd numbers. By the end of the war, every street had the name of one of the martyrs, somebody that who had died at the war. So it, it affects your psyche, knowing all these people are dying, all these young men are getting killed at the battlefield for what? For this regime that doesn't let us to have any kind of freedom. They are forcing women to wear hijab and cover themselves. They are not allowing us to drink alcohol, to eat pork, to, to listen to the music, to dance, to sing. This government really is against every happiness in life. I, I, I really don't get it. It's not a regular dictatorship. Regular dictatorship just don't allow you to take part in the politics. But these right. people dictate their morals on us. They corrupt moral issues, I should say. And that's something that was very difficult for me to bear, you know. So you had an awareness from a young age between, I mean, obviously your family raised you in a way to, to, to be a free thinker. And I would dare say that the majority of my Iranian friends, and in fact, I would think the majority of Iranians would tell me that Jason, Iran, majority of the people we run don't don't believe this sort of thing it's just that we're living under this dictatorship this hold and it's very difficult of course when they have the guns and you don't have the power it's very tough to make change because they will kill you they will or they will torture you they will do very horrible things to you and your family so how do you how um you know as, as a teenager and you you bravely leaned into this you spent time in a really bad place. We talk a lot about it now, even prison, like it almost I should, if it rolls too easily from the tongue, frankly, because now we just, you know, all the human rights groups talk about it and people are living there. We work with people who have been unlawfully in prison there. How was that place back then? It hasn't changed much, but how was it as a young person? It was terrible. It was scary and it was surreal, you know, and since my brother was arrested in 1981, uh, I had some idea of what is prison, what's going on. Of course, for the first three years, they wouldn't even allow the sisters to go visit him. Mm. Uh, they didn't want any young person in the prison, so they don't get, uh, what you call it? So they won't be encouraged to follow their, 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 their steps of their brothers, you know what I mean? So they wouldn't allow us, only the sisters and brothers who were over 30 years they could do visits, uh, but later on they would allow us once a year. But anyhow, because of the, what my mother was saying and the people would come out, I knew it's not a pleasant place and they are torturing and they are whipping people. And uh, I knew about the atrocities inside, but that's another story when you get arrested yourself and yeah. you go there. I was lucky that I was arrested in 1983. And at the time, because of all the atrocities in the prison, and the outcry of the of the world against it, um, the the second person in command, the next person, Montazeri, Ayatollah Montazeri, that was supposed to be the next supreme leader, which later on actually they put him aside. But anyway, at the time he was the number two power in Iran. He had sent uh, groups into the prisons to look around and make sure atrocities doesn't happen. So when I so that was lucky for me when I was arrested they didn't whip me but 
I was always blindfolded. I was in the solitary confinement. I was seeing other people getting beaten, getting hit, and hearing their voices while you're sitting for hours in the corridors waiting for your prosecutor to talk to you again blindfolded. Uh, you would hear all these screams and cries and seeing their bloody mm. feet. So these are these are not pleasant stuff. And just being in the solitary confinement with no book, nothing. It's it's a really difficult situation to be in. How big? How, how, how big was your? How small was your cell in solitary confinement? Do you remember? Uh, very small. There are there are no pictures. I mean, uh, people have drawn it and stuff. Very very small. I don't know, like ten steps. The toilet was there. You had only one toilet and one sink to wash your hands. Once a week, they would take you out for the shower, which was uh, less than twenty minutes. Which that was uh, again an, another of my nightmares. I was always scared that they opened the door on me while I'm taking a shower. So I got used to shower so fast. You know, nobody was still you know, thirty. <laughs> 35 years later, I still can't stay in the shower for a long, you know, I right away get out because of all the memories and stuff. Mm. So, well, you, you've obviously channeled it, though, in a very positive way. And you, you becoming a voice for people who uh, have gone through similar ordeals and have not been able to do it. So what you're doing is a testament to your, uh, your to, to your family, your work, and, and, you, and you're, you're a brave person. And um, not a lot of people can channel the energy the way you're channeling it. Um, and she has, by the way, friends, she hasn't even talked about even some of the more gruesome part, which we're going to talk about right now a little bit and introduce the subject matter, because in addition to her being unlawfully in prison, held hostage uh, for her beliefs, for speaking up and wanting a better country for her people, uh, her brother paid the ultimate price. And... Give a little bit of context to people who maybe are not familiar with uh, the 1988 massacres and what exactly happened leading up to that, because it took a while, but eventually it became a very gruesome scene. As I mentioned, my brother, we were upper middle class and my brother was living in England, going to school there. And when the revolution happened against my father's wishes, he decided to come back and help the country to be rebuilt. A lot of students from foreign countries came back including my brother. He had left his views and uh, when he was arrested three years later, first of all, they did uh, cultural revolution. So they closed all the universities. When he entered, he entered university in Iran. But a year later, Khomeini, that was always crazing universities before during Shah because all the demonstrations started there. Uh, he hated the universities because the universities were standing in front of him and in front of all the dictatorship he was trying to uh, subjugate us to. So he, the first thing they closed the universities to take that uh, battlefield away from the students, right? So then there is no jobs, there is no school. What is it that you're supposed to do? Uh, so my brother was always at home sitting and reading and he was a very dedicated person to his party, to his ideas. And uh, we have now his, his writings that he, right. all the memos he's taking from the books and writing down and coming up with ideas. You know what I mean? He loved playing chess the whole time. He, he had learned how to play chess even with closed eyes because he wanted <laughs> to beat everybody. I mean, he, he, he was full of life and full of these ideas and these, these things that just ideas. And uh, when in uh, 1981, unfortunately, all his group was under, uh, what they did is when they would arrest somebody and beat them up and they would give up their names, they wouldn't go right away to arrest them. They would start uh, following that person to figure out the rest of them, right? So mm -hmm. this operation took like six months. Now we know that it took them six months to recognize every person in his particular party. And in the summer of uh, 1981, they arrest all of them. And uh, they started beating them up and blah, blah. No indictment, no nothing. They called us, uh, one of his friends called our home that he was under pressure. So he called and made an appointment with him on the square of our neighborhood. And he went there and they arrested him. This way, when they arrest you on the streets for four months, we didn't even know he's arrested. My mother every day had to go to the morgues, to the hospitals, to in front of prisons and asking, where is my son? And nobody would answer you. And, mm. You know, I was 13. I, I never forget that summer. My mother never cooked, never cleaned, never did nothing. He, she couldn't. She couldn't get out of the bed with the worry that where is my son? What happened to him? 
And finally, after four months, they, they told us that he is in prison. And for two years, they wouldn't even take him to the court because they wanted to find other things against him. These are all illegal acts, even based on their own uh, backward laws. All of this is illegal, but they committed in any way. So we were under the impression that he's going to be released because all he had done was belonging to a leftist party, right, uh, uh, distributing pamphlets when they were allowed to be uh, distributed because once they, they announced all the groups and parties illegal, there were, nobody could even print any pamphlets to be distributed to begin with. Anyhow, so they gave him 10 years prison, which was unbelievable. So my mother went to a lot of places in front of the courts and see judges and prison uh, personnel. The, uh, the answer was always the same thing. He has to work with us. All they wanted was that the prisoners become informant for them and tell about their friends and repent. That's another thing that is very special about the Islamic regime of Iran. It doesn't matter what you did. What matters is that you work with them and repent. Mm. Then they would change your, um, your prison sentence. A lot of people got freed after they were named names and let their friends get arrested. You know, let, and my let, me ask, let, let me ask you a question about that. We'll, we'll pick up the story with your brother in one second, but it's important for our listeners to understand what Laudan is saying. And she has said a few things that I'd like her to just uh, crystallize a bit for folks so they understand what they were up against, because this is not an ordinary jail. Uh, when she says courts, these are not ordinary courts. I think she would agree that there is no rule of law well, the rule of law in, Tehr in Iran basically is what the Supreme Leader says it is. So any notion of due process, impartiality, being it doesn't exist. But she said something important, and I'd like her to shortly you know, briefly explain what she means when there was this cultural revolution. Like what was happening in Iran that motivated, you know, just nine years or eight years after the revolution happened, young men and women like you to jump into this? What was happening that motivated you all to jump into this fight? Because we all had fight for not having political prisoners, to be free, to, to be able to say what we want. We wanted democracy, we wanted freedom. We didn't expect, because Khomeini, when he was in France, he was saying everybody is free to participate in the political. I don't want any power. I just want to go sit in there and be a religious leader. As soon as he came to Iran, he started to killing everybody closing all the parties, telling everybody you have no rights and uh, labeling everybody with this, with this disgraceful name, you know, the, mm. some, calling them Muharreb, someone who wages war against God. I mean, how do you describe who is the person who <laughs> wages war against war? You know what I mean? You are a lawyer yourself. You understand how absurd all of this is, you know, somebody who uh, spreads corruption on the earth. I mean, who the hell is that? So this thing, if you drink alcohol, you speak up, you eat pork, you are distributing corruption on the earth, you know? So, and the court, I agree with you, there was no lawyer, always blindfolded, you couldn't defend yourself, nothing. I can testimony my own court, not even five minutes. I didn't even know I'm going to a court. I was called out from the cell, I'm sitting somewhere, they take me to a room, some men are there that I can't see. So they started yelling and screaming at me about some pamphlets that they had got from my friend, and I said, those were uh, the only thing I was able to say in that room was that those are not my pamphlets. And he told me, shut up. You don't speak, you idiot. Mm. And then somebody told something in his ear. And then he said, OK, get out. I, I didn't understand what happened. So it turned out at that room in that five minutes, I got a three year sentence mm. and three years not being able to leave the country. And I was released conditionally by signing a letter saying I won't do any political activity so, anymore. So pretty much, so th for those of you who do not follow Iran history closely, I guess it's safe to say that the Ayatollah uh, Khamenei just hijacked a religion to advance a power grab is what he did. I mean... I, I, I don't like that description because these are exactly what Prophet Muhammad did to its own people as well. Mm. So if they wanted to follow, actually, Islam, we are lucky because we stood up in front of this government. Iran Islamic regime is the first caliphate in the world. Before mm. Daesh, before IS, ISIS, Taliban, Iran did the caliphate. <laughs> this regime is the caliphate. Mm. And uh, it's just that the 
because we stood up in front of them, they are not able to do exactly what Taliban and ISIS do. Otherwise, this regime, regime is more brutal than that. So your brother, your family, you're struggling. Uh, there's resistance inside the country. Your brother's picked up. And when, when we when we took this little side uh, uh, sidebar conversation, if you will, for uh, talk about what the climate was like, your brother was in jail. Tell us a little bit of how that was like. We were able to visit with him. When was the last time you spoke with him and what ultimately led them to include him in that group of people and, and explain to folks what happened in 1988? My brother, uh, the, the, first, the first two years, the visitations was very unregular and whenever they wanted and whatever, but later got better once a month. And later on, sometimes twice a month, they would allow my parents to visit. So you had to go spend the whole day <laughs> to just be in line and wait and da, 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 to be able to visit your loved one, mm. which a lot of people couldn't even do because you had to take off from work and stuff to, to do this process. But anyhow, um, during all these six, and a, uh, six years and three months that he was in prison, he, they were always shortage of food. They wouldn't give them books. They were beating them up. I mean, we, no dictatorship after giving you your sentence, then regularly they beat you or they mm. torture you. You know what I mean? Mm. Because you don't have any information to give anymore. You are in prison for God's sake. Mm. But the Islamic regime, everything is backward. Uh, so a lot of time parents, I want to talk about the resistance of the parents and wives and brothers and sisters that all these years stood up in front of the government. They would go to the different uh, organizations of Iran in front of the uh, judicial system and going seeing the second guy in command, Montazari, in front of his house and would complain about everything that is happening to the prisoners and would say there is no hot water to shower, there is no... Um, not enough food and vegetables and stuff like that, but that nobody would listen. And uh, what happened in 1988 is the is already planned. Two years a earlier, they gave uh, uh, questionnaires to all the prisoners, and so they knew who is leftist, who is MKO, which is Mujahideen have a particular group that they were another Islamic group that was. Uh, took arm against the regime and had its own people in Iraq. Um, so those were one group, the rest were all leftist groups. So mm. they separated them from each other. And then the, all the prisoners, other than ideological difference, they were also separated based on the prison term. If you had less than 10 years, you had 10 and above, you have uh, 15. So they knew who they want to get rid of. Because mm. as I said, there were people who already had a spend. They had two years prison term, four years prison term. They already had finished. But they were telling them, until you don't come in front of TV and confess to your crimes and don't say, I won't do this anymore. I don't let you go. And they were refusing. They were saying, I didn't do nothing to come and confess in front of TV. So because of this, they were staying in there. So when Mujahideen, when Iran accepted the peace, which was something that Khomeini himself, the supreme leader at the time, he said that I, this is like drinking venom for me, accepting this peace because their plan was to take over Baghdad, uh, Iraq, and from there going taking over Israel, right? They, mm. I'm telling you, they wanted the Islamic Khalifa right before ISIS. Mm. So he was very upset that he wasn't able to conquer all the Islamic countries and he was revengeful. And then at the same time, Mujahideen attacked the borders of Iran and not only Islamic regime killed all the war prisoners that in that attack were arrested, which is against all the international conventions and rules and laws of combat. Then they came back to the prisons and started killing all the Mujahideens with this wow. excuse that you helped the people in the border. Hmm. But all the visitations was behind the Mirror, uh, behind glass uh, walls with the phone that was always checked by the securities. There was no way anybody could plot anything with people outside. My own father was arrested once just because he showed his fist to my brother. My, bro my father had hearing aids, he couldn't even hear. So in the six years my brother was in the jail, my father even couldn't hear his voice because he couldn't use these phones. 
Wow. And so he was just born looking at him. And my, again, my father was a teacher, so he was always into, oh, it's healthy, don't get catch cold, be careful, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he saw that he's sick. He had, he had catch cold and looked very pale. So my father just raised his fist telling him, you know, be strong. And they, they came and they started beating my brother up on the other side and dragging my parents. And they were so scared. And they told my father, how dare you show your fist? And my father was saying, what's wrong with showing my fist? I was asking him to be careful and watch. And they made my father to sign a letter saying that he wouldn't show his fist anymore. So in this condition, then they're claiming that prisoners were helping people at the border to have that fight, which was untrue. And when they saw that there is no international condemnation, because at the same time, everybody was so worried about the resolution of 598 for ceasefire between Iran and Iraq. Mm. So even though we let the world know, UN knew, Amnesty International knew, but they didn't condemn Iran strongly. So Amnesty is the only one. Amnesty in 16 August 1988 issued urgent notices uh, urgent action notice to all his followers and sent, sent, sent letters to Iranian government all over the world asking them to stop these executions. So if at the time UN had reacted and condemned Iran, my brother would be alive because my brother was executed 12 days later on August 28th. But unfortunately, Galin the Paul, the uh, representative to the United Nations, he didn't take these allegations seriously and he was uh, Professor Geoffrey Robertson calls him naive, naive to, to yeah. put it in a polite way. He calls him naive for thinking that Iran itself is a stop. So yeah, and I brother, think I think it's important for listeners to know that um, Laden is talking about thousands of people executed, and this was not something that was done in a very I mean, there's no justification for what was done, but it was done in such a brazen and callous way. Uh, if you read some of the accounts documented by Amnesty International, and by the way, this, for those of you who don't follow this very closely, even Canada has named this a crime against humanity. Italy has made some similar declarations and it's considered amongst some international scholars. And we're gonna get into that in a, after we talk about uh, an interesting development here in the States an ongoing crime against humanity. Uh, so this this has not ended. They may have started this back in 1988, but the killings, the torture, the targeting, the uh, the attempted, uh, I believe there's been a targeted elimination campaign to get rid of people um, just because they think differently and uh, they are a distinct class of people who have been uh, singled out by the regime who claim to be doing this in the name of religion, which we know it's not. Um, and it's it's uh, quite atrocious. Now, the interesting part of this, and this is where we get into some of the justice and accountability work that Laudan has been doing and other family members have been trying to raise awareness of this, is that a lot of the bad people who did some of this are still around. Uh, how does it tie into uh, what's happening in Iran today? And then we'll come to the United States to talk a little bit about that. I'd just like to add that more than 5,000 people were executed, uh, were mm -hmm. hanged, mm -hmm. were hanged without due process of the law. Mm -hmm. And their, their bodies were dumped in unmarked mass graves that we still don't know where they are. And the families were denied the right of proper mourning because they would attack us in our uh, mourning sessions that we had in our own homes because they wouldn't allow us. Mourning is something very public. It's a public event in Iran. You have to go to the cemetery. You have to cry your eyes out. Mm -hmm. Your family members have to come and console you. All of that, we were denied of all of that. And even in our own homes, we were insecure. And 30 some years later, we still don't know where Bijan is. They told it specifically to my father. When my father asked, when they called him and told him to go to the prison three and a half months later after he was killed, and they told my father that he's killed, my father asked for his body and they told him, your son was an apostate and he doesn't have any place in this mm. world, mm. just go. And uh, so the accountability, we, know, we, we now know because 10 years later, that second guy in command that was supposed to be a Supreme Leader and later was put aside from the power, he wrote in his memoir that uh, Khomeini had issued an Islamic fatwa ordering the killings of Mujahideen 
with the excuse that they are again uh, they are waging war against God, Muharab. He called them mm. Muharab, and using these derogatory, uh, derogatory names, uh, justifying their killings. So, he, how do you he, how, how do you interpret? I mean, at the time, why did it take so long for Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and these establishment organizations of human rights to say something? Why did it take so long, do you think? I the think there is people a not, the people... Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Mm -hmm. You know what, Islamic regime of Iran has been very successful in using Western tools, organizations, and culture to further its own agenda and goals. Mm. So they pretend like they have an uh, election. They pretend like they have a judicial system. They pretend like all of this exists. So people get confused. These organizations, they don't understand they are, they are dealing with the Khalifa, not with the regular regime. Hmm. So uh, then also, you know, they are, they're so rich, they have the petroleum money. I, I really, really suspect maybe well, in the poor got even some money under the table. Who knows? At, the, at this point, who knows? Um, who did what to stay quiet? For whatever reason, they stayed quiet. Again, Amnesty was the only one who spoke up, but United Nations, now we think maybe just because they wanted the resolution to pass, they stayed quiet. And another problem is our life doesn't matter to them. That's the reality. You are an American yourself. You know, I, I'm a naturalized American. You are a born American and you work to release the um, hostages in Iran, in American hostages in Iran. Why the American hostages life matters, but our life there doesn't matter. You know what I mean? We are willing to put human rights aside and we talk about atomic bomb and interference of Iran in, in the Middle East, but human rights should be the first goal of us everywhere in the world. So we what do you say what, what, for, for the listener who's this probably going to be shocked? I know why you're saying it, but explain to folks who maybe are not used to hearing this. Why, why do you say that our lives don't matter to these people? To those people because, over there. because look at right now uh, president biden's administration i i voted for biden i'm a democrat but for god's sake you brought the same team as president obama another president who i who i but voted for that they basically think iran deserves what is good they don't think middle east deserves democracy they think we're a bunch of savages that at the end of the day we deserve what we, we are Muslim. We want this. We don't want this. Look at all the Iranian women that are in jail. They're protesting. They don't want this regime. Right now, there is uh, all kinds of um, protests going on in Iran, and they just kill us on the street. I mean, it's, it's just amazing that uh, this, this team that President Biden has keeps giving concessions to Iran. You don't give concessions to a bully. It's a bully. Why? Just today, they, they, they unilaterally took some other people out of the sanction list. You know, After one... Iran had bombed U.S., I mean, U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. Why are you doing this? I don't you know, get it. You know, one of the positions that we as an organization take on any country that is unlawfully holding Americans or U.S. legal permanent residents is we shouldn't, you know, this should be at the very top of the list of any issue that we discuss with regimes that do these sorts of things. And in the case of Iran, uh, I'm not sure why we sat down to talk to them to begin with. It should have been a condition preceding to everything. So until they released the hostages and they were concrete agreements on human rights, there's not much to talk about with Iran right now. At least that's what we thought. And I, quite, I don't quite understand how the Germans or the French or the British can just go around and pretending like nothing's going on. And guess what? You know this. The JCPOA countries include China, Russia, right? Well, those two yeah. countries are hostage takers. They are holding Americans hostage. Why are we talking and sitting down like if we're all equals? We're not equals, right? I mean, Iran is not an equal to any of these countries to begin with. I mean, the people are. The people are wonderful people. But the, the government is terrible. So you know, why do you think that keeps happening? Because I'm pretty sure way back when, when this happened to your brother, to get and the thousands of others who were slaughtered uh, by somebody who had his hand in this, including the man who was just, quote unquote, elected president. What is the lack of outrage from the responsible nations or these NGOs that do not want to hide, uh, pay, put a spotlight on the human rights of the Iranian people? 
What what is the issue? Because it's been going on for decades. They are selfish. Europeans are selfish. They they put their economic interest in front of everything else. Mm. They want the they want the oil. Iran is a rich oil country, and then they know. Oh, I can I can sell them everything I want. How do you think? In the 2009, when people on the streets, the green movement came, millions of people were on the streets. How do you think they suppressed us? Do you think Iran can make its own shields and uh, the water cars that attack people and everything? They were buying all of them from Germany, for God's sake. Even the is the funny thing is the the um, police that was uh, brutally suppressing the protesters. All the equipment was saying in English and German on it, police. You know, they couldn't even write it in Farsi because they had <laughs> just bought it from these countries. You know, it, it is laughable. It, it is really it's have sad. To cry. It's very sad. You know, to hear all this. the all the listening devices to the telecommunication of Iran was sold by Germany to Iran. And when we complain, they say, "Oh my God, we sold it for lawful use." You think? A rogue regime <laughs> uses it for lawful. Uh, I mean, who do you think we are? You think we're stupid that you deal with us like this? You know, in the United I States, the United States gets criticized a lot, and um, it, it it's um, a, almost like a sport by many European countries and European NGOs about. Well, you know, you do this in many countries, and you you sell these weapons, and you do this. But you're right. Germany is one of the uh, Iran's largest trade partners in Europe, and they sell them all sorts of things and instruments of war and instruments of repression, and they seem to get away with it. Nobody seems to call them out on it. So I'm glad your your group has done it. In fact, we're working with a family now uh, to help on the release of Jamshid Sharmad, who happy they're in Americans, they're out there in California. And uh, he, but the father, the man who was kidnapped in in some third country, is German national. And I, for the life of me, I cannot believe the lack of interest at times by the German foreign ministry about this case. Yeah, exactly. Just today, the Human Rights Watch, under the pressure of Jerusalem Post reporter Mr. Weintraub, finally sent a tweet defending Mr. Sharmat's uh, rights. Where is Germany standing here? He was only a resident in America, which I'm proud of America for defending Jamshid Sharmat's rights. But where is Germany standing? Doesn't even mention his name. And no. he's a citizen of dual system of Germany, for God's sake. I mean, these people, again, when it comes to our lives, it doesn't matter. We are we are spendable, right? Oh, we're, we're no, just... you're, not, you're not expendable. Don't say that. I mean, that's... Uh... Uh, but we are to Germany and to uh, England and to France, uh, <laughs> very shameful countries, to be honest with you. Do you think those countries have helped keep that government in power in Tehran? Do you think they? Of course they did. If, they... if it wasn't for them, we had toppled this regime 25 years ago. I agree with okay. you. I agree uh, you with know, you. What, what, what I agree with, you know, Kasper of the chess player, he, he writes something very interesting about Russia. We are, it's interesting that how we are. We have the same views, you know, that everything that works for them, for them will work for us too. So he always argues that in, uh, implement Magnitsky Act, you know, put these sanctions, don't don't meet with Putin. That's what he wants, this recognition. This meet doesn't matter. Even if you yell at him in a meeting, just the fact that you gave him meeting, that means you recognize him. Don't do it. So every time I retweet and say, oh, I agree with Putin, this the same thing, but I, I agree, I'm sorry, with Kasparov, the same thing goes for Iran as well. People from India, people from Russia, they always see something. Oh, it, it works for us as well. You know, all we want is that sacred human rights. Put that on the table and say, this is what we stand for. So you believe? Then so you? So you believe with Iran when they're used correctly, the sanctions can work and the pressure can work. Look at the pressure. How, how much it works. I mean, I was against everything President Trump has done for, except the maximum pressure on Iran. <laughs> I mean, this is working for God's sake. When Trump was president, did Iran have any courage to do a bombing in Syria or in Iraq or attack U.S.'s uh, interests? No, they had shut up and sat in their place and didn't know what to do. As soon as President Biden came, the rogue acts already started again. They go all over the world, create problems for American interests and for our national security, create problems. Well, let, let's bring it home. I'm glad you mentioned America because you, you're engaged in a little, well, not little. This is a pretty significant struggle right here. Um, something that unfortunately 
has contaminated several American universities. Today, we're going to focus on one of them because you and a group of um, family members, a large group of family members, have publicly called for Oberlin College to make some changes. What is happening at Oberlin College? I think it's going to shock some of our listeners about what's taking place over there. Oberlin College has hired Iran's representative to the United Nations, permanent representative to the United Nations at the time of the massacre, that his job basically was to deny and cover up all the atrocities of Iran's regime. And even before that, for five years, he was the head of the foreign ministry in Tehran, overseeing all the communications with United Nations and creating problems against the resolutions and mm. denying and all of that. He's now a peace professor from all things at Oberlin College. Peace teaching, professor, huh? Teaching mm. ethics, ethics and morality to, 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 to American students. I mean, Orwell couldn't write a story like this for God's sake. I want to shoot myself every time I hear his his name. Is, is this the he, guy? Is, is this the guy of Mohammed Malati? Yeah, Mohammed Jafar Mahalati. So we wrote back in October to Oberlin, and again, I am a Democrat myself. Our liberalism is my thing. This is my <laughs> view. So I I thought, oh my God, I just write a letter to Oberlin. They are gonna say, oh yeah, we're gonna fire his ass. But guess what? Eight months later, they don't even. They don't even acknowledge they got our letter. They don't mention our name. They block us. Their president blocks us on Twitter for not us, all the human rights lawyers who defended us and said, oh my God, are you going to answer these people? Right away, they were blocked. So, by the way, you had so, so people understand this, and we'll post a link to the letter. Um, Laden's talking about not just one or two people, but she brought together a group of people, almost 56 family members of the victims, as well as almost 600 additional signatories that included international jurists and uh, work that's been done by people who have studied this problem, including evidence. I mean, you can't hide the fact that this fellow was representing Iran at the United Nations, and basically they were a mouthpiece. He was a mouthpiece uh, who could have used that position to you know, sh shine a light on what was happening back in Tehran. He chose to hide it. And she and her colleagues, all they did was point out to Oberlin College, do you realize who's working there? Do you realize what this person did or didn't do? So what, what happened when, they, when, when, when you finally got this coalition going? What, what happened? I mean, how did they react when they received all these signatures and documentation about what happened? Of course, they didn't answer us at all so far. Very shameful. Mm -hmm. uh, they just answered to an inquiry again uh, of uh, Mr. Wayne Holm from Jerusalem Post at the time that he asked, you know, what, what's your answer? They said, oh, we are, we, are, we are looking into allegations of 30 years ago. First of all, crimes against humanity doesn't have a statute of li uh, limitation. Secondly, how dare you? You are publicizing him as a representative to the United Nations to get more students and charge more and when we tell you he committed crimes against humanity that is documented by Amnesty International and he's accused of by the documentation of Amnesty International, you are telling us this allegation of 30 years ago? I mean, how dare you? Seriously. You know, when and he, then when, later when... on, it turned out that he's also anti-Semite and he also spoke against Baha'i, one of the Iran's religious minorities that are persecuted by this government. So let me so ask you something. Government... When he talks about because I, when when I was getting ready to talk to you, I did some research on this person. You know, I had heard of Iranian regime officials working in places like Princeton and some other universities, but I had never heard Oberlin College had taken people in. Also, he he's an interesting guy. When he speaks, he says something. He has a speech he gave recently where he likes to say, "Peace has become homeless." I mean, he starts attacking America, and he starts attacking indirectly Iranian opposition people. And he does it with a smug look in his face as if somehow he can do this with impunity and nothing that he did or failed to do before matters. I mean, I find it quite offensive. And it's, you know, why, when, when, when we talk about accountability, folks, this is the work that we're talking about. What the work that Laudan and her friends are trying to do is to raise awareness just because you maybe even repented 
maybe you had an act, you know, a, uh, you know, I guess the best way I could compare this to people who don't follow uh, Iran politics. Imagine if, you know, Hitler's, Hitler's people were somehow brought over here and used and nobody paid and, and they were had their hands in genocide and they had their hands in war crimes. And we just looked the other way. That's not the way this works. America is not a haven for people who were facilitators of crimes against humanity. And as Amnesty International has said, this is an ongoing crime against humanity. The killings are uh, not over and the accountability is not over. There's no statute of limitation on this. Have you asked your congressman, uh, the, the congressman who represents Oberlin College, his name is Congressman Jim Jordan. He's on ju the Judiciary Committee or Senator Rob Portman or Senator Sherrod Brown. Have you all brought this matter to their attention? Do they know what's happening in Oberlin College? Unfortunately, not yet. Again, because I had high hopes for Oberlin College and I thought they are going to do the right things. And then there was pandemic. We couldn't go protest there and everything. So they got it easy so far because we didn't fully mobilize our campaign against them. And we only stayed on social media thinking mm. by shaming them, they will do the right thing. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that it's not only Oberlin. Everything starts with Columbia University right, because the right. petroleum companies gave them money to promote Iran because they want that market. Um, so they all start as a rite of passage. All these uh, people who committed crimes against humanity in Iran, they start with Columbia and then they go to Princeton and after Princeton, probably Harvard, and then they end up other places like Oberlin College. And we have documentation at Arabia printed out a report that these universities receive hundreds of thousands of dollars from Alabi Foundation that is right now under FBI investigation and closed uh, one of the one of Iran's entities, NGOs that, that transferred money to these universities and stuff, I guess, to get them. <laughs> we'll post that. Yeah, we'll post that if you send it to us. Let me ask you a question. We'll get back to the universities in a minute. Has Mahaladi ever apologized or been contrite? Uh, right, uh, right after we wrote the letter, the next day he issued an, a statement, and he, like usual, he attacked the signatory of letters. He called us war mongers, uh, attacking our personality the same way that Iran's regime does, and calls its uh, opponents' names. And then he said, oh, this was a very bad thing. I didn't know. His excuses, I didn't know. Like all the Nazis uh, people that they say, we, I didn't know. He says, I don't know, which we have documents that he knew. He knew exactly, and he denied, and he lied. But oh. Oberlin closes its eyes. Yeah, nobody becomes the, the diplomat or representative for Iran at the United Nations without the Supreme Leader approving it. And exactly. I mean, it's not. A, and by the way, he or she, it's always, it'd always be a he with these people. Um, yes. <laughs> and these, they will never put a woman there. But the, these uh, the he will do as he's told. And uh, he knows what to say and what not to say. And diplomats, they can try all these games to hide what they say or don't know. But ultimately, yes, he knew. He knew as UN representative what was happening over there. You couldn't hide it. It was, it was a matter of public First record. of all, this atrocity wasn't the first one. Before 1988, the atrocity started from 1979. So it was 10 years. It was happening. UN had resolutions after resolutions condemning Iran for right. atrocities. That's right. So he knew what kind of position he's accepting. And as I said, his job was actually to cover up all of these five years before in the foreign ministry. And then he said in one of his podcasts, in a, in a talk in, in a called Dialogue with somebody, he says, my, I decided that why are we even letting these resolutions pass and then we condemn it? We should go and water it down. We should go and argue and in, insert our own ideas in it. And that's the reason they sent me there. These are the things he says it himself in Parsi's dialogue, uh, podcast himself. He confesses to all of this. Plus the date, I put all the dates together and it shows in the UN when he was defending, he was specifically new and he, he came back to Iran and three months later and spoke to the newspapers in Iran and he condemned the resolution of uh, UN. So he knew he's just lying and uh, Oberlin closes his eyes. But uh, in defense of Oberlin, just one thing, at least they put him on sabbatical this term. They didn't allow him to go to the class and poison the minds of American students. So I guess that's some kind of achievement. It is an achievement and you have to keep building on that. And we're going to uh, make sure that Representative Jim Jordan 
in the House who represents Oberlin College, Senator Rob Portman and Senator Sherrod Brown know about this podcast. And we're going to make sure that they know more about the case because I think they need to raise awareness themselves and from their perch on those committees that they serve on. And they serve on some pretty powerful committees in the Senate and the House. I think they should uh, uh, be aware that uh, there is a former Iranian regime official uh, hiding out in Oberlin College. So we're going to make sure they see that. Now, tell, uh, share a little bit more about, because our listeners won't know this, why do the Iranian regime put people at these universities? A lot of people don't know. Everybody knows about China, or they should know about the the Chinese using our universities to penetrate and undermine our nation. Why do the why does it why do, why do the Iranians keep doing it, and why do they get away and why do they get away with it? Because nobody seems to know, by the way, that Princeton has all these former regime officials, including, by the way, I'm sure you know this, a spokesman that used to work for uh, Zarif. He's over there now teaching at Princeton. Yeah, and Musavian, who is uh, implicated in the Mykonos massacre of the Kurdish uh, exactly. leaders in, exactly. in Germany, he is in Princeton. And uh, Zarif himself, at the time of 1988 massacre, was working for Mahalati in the United Nations. So wow. he is implicated in all of this as well. Wow. Um, and the reason, is, the reason is obvious, because these people do all kinds of atrocities in our countries. Nobody's allowed to speak up. No, again, nobody is even allowed to drink what they want, eat what they want, wear <laughs> what they want, let alone speak. And then they use the freedom of America and Europe and put their own uh, proxies in there so they can raise a new generation uh, sympathetic to them and to the, their agenda. Look at the President Biden and President Obama's team. They're all young Americans that they they've been uh, tricked by this idea that, oh, peace and dialogue and stuff, dialogue with animals doesn't get nowhere. Can you talk to a dog, cow and make him understand what you want? Uh, so this peace, I am pro-peace, but peace sometimes in order to get to peace, you need to do the war. So these people that at any price, they say, I am a peaceful person, I don't agree with that. Sometimes war is a tool that you are forced to use to get to the peace. Um, and this is something that these people commit all kinds of atrocities against their own people. And then they come in the education system in America and uh, do propaganda that, oh, my God, let's be peaceful. Let's have dialogue. Yeah, so they basically have been used. So they're using our academic. So basically, they're hiding behind academic freedom to spread their misinformation. And they're using it as a perch to work against the United States and work against freedom and work against human rights, because ultimately that's what they're doing. And it's uh, ho horrible. And it's, I'm so glad that there are people like you who are shining a light on the regime and what they are trying to do in the United States, because it's not something that we hear a lot about. Yeah, exactly. Their, their propaganda machine must be stopped because they lie, they cheat, and they use, again, the freedom here, the freedom, academic freedom and everything to just further their own agenda. If you listen to his speak, when he speaks in America, it's all about friendship between religions. Then when he speaks in Turkey, in the groups of Muslims, then he speaks about superiority of Islam. Yeah, Suddenly he, the yeah, tone he, changes. He, it changes, <laughs> and, and as I, I, I saw that. I, I saw a few of his uh, talks, and I was uh, shocked. At, uh, not really, because uh, I've dealt with some of these people before and they'll say one thing here and they'll say something else somewhere else. And, you know, nowadays, though, you can't hide because there's YouTube, there's uh, social media and there's uh, it's the world becomes a smaller place for them. They, it really exactly. does. It, it, it becomes much smaller. And even though we've talked about some very difficult subject matter, uh, the good news is I believe that if you look at the course of history and you look at centuries of history and you look at our society today it's never been such a good time to be a human rights defender like you because they can't hide that much anymore and and there's a lot of tools that we can use to peacefully shine a light make sure there's accountability done before we let you go because we're running out of time i want you to share a little bit also about some of the work that you were doing uh, you were involved in a, a series of tribunals private tribunals uh, that went through painstaking research 
uh, of human rights abuses in Iran. A lot of people don't know about those. Can you share briefly what those tribunals were like? Because you did some work here, some England, and also at The Hague. Yes, what we did in back in 2010, we decided to start documenting this atrocity and do a, a tribunal just similar to the Russell and uh, Sartre tribunal against the uh, Vietnam War. And we were able to bring in international uh, judges from all over the world. And uh, in London, first we did a, uh, the first session in London in June for a week. Um, about 90 of us testified to everything mm. that we had felt, the uh, former political prisoners and the families of the victims. So they testified to everything they went through because one of the things Iran Islamic regime did, we don't have any documentation. I don't have any arrest warrant or indictment, any written document about my brother's sentence, right? Any um, and the death certificate we just got, but doesn't, doesn't say that he was executed. So first we had to establish that this atrocity happened and it happened to a lot of us and it was systematic. So that was done in June of 2012 in London. And mm -hmm. after those judges, they issued their, their findings that they agree with us that this atrocity happened. Then in, uh, in Hague, we went and we put Islamic regime of Iran on trial. And in there, they uh, condemned Iran and they ordered it to to be reviewed all of this, which again, this is all symbolic because um, it didn't have any, um, any power, this tribunal, but it really, really helped uh, document everything and it helped the voices of the victims to be heard. And then later on in 2014, the South Korea gave the Guangzhou Award of Human Rights to the mothers of Havaran. Havaran is the mm. name of the, one of the mass graves cemeteries in Iran that the parents, it's a contested land that for the past 30 years, parents saved it as one of the symbols of atrocities of the Islamic regime. So the, the mother's parents, uh, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, they're collectively called as mothers of Havaran. They received this human rights prize in South Korea for their courage and for uh, standing up in front of the regime that I had the honor of accompanying my mother to go there and receive this award with uh, Mrs. Milani in, on behalf of the, all the mothers. Mm -hmm. um, so we have been doing a lot to, to bring this up and this uh, last so-called election, which is actually not an even election doesn't exist because there is no parties in Iran or any uh, uh, liberation, it's just casting a vote. But now one of the people that was on the death commission putting, putting my brother and the rest to death uh, he is the president of Iran, and the other one is the, just was appointed as the uh, head of the judiciary system. So it's a good thing that the world now can see finally the real face of these people, that they have the blood of thousands on their hands and they're getting promoted. Yeah, I think it's, it may seem symbolic now. In fact, I know it's much more than that because I know that when Iran is free of these uh, zealots, these evildoers, there will be an accounting and the free people of Iran will be able to sit in judgment and hold to account uh, those who wrong their people and they will face accusers in courts of law and they will have to answer for what they did. And all this work that you have done and your colleagues have done will be extremely useful uh, in that process. And it's you're building a uh, not just memory, but you're also sowing the seeds of justice. You know, justice moves slow. Justice at times can move very slow. And justice at times can be messy. Uh, but you have to lean into it the way you're doing. And it's remarkable that your community has been able to keep this going. And it's going to pay off in the long run. I really believe that. And, and talking about the long run, since we're running out of time, uh, if you have any advice, we always like to ask our guests, especially for younger folks who contact us asking to help. And we always have volunteers and we, we enjoy uh, training the next generation of human rights defender and especially lawyers who want to get into this space. We encourage it as a career move. It can be extremely rewarding. What do you, what, what pieces of advice would you have for them if somebody wants to become more involved in this space, what should they be doing? You shouldn't be discouraged. As you said, uh, this path is a long path. And remember that the history is on our side. Mm. These kind of thugs won't stay in power forever. 
And what suggestion I have for the US decision makers is that Iranian people have a lot in common with Americans. And it's in the best, in US's best interest to help the freedom movement in Iran. Put your money on the people instead mm. of such a brutal government that commits atrocities, doesn't believe in West, is the enemy of the United States and everything it stands for. Stands mm. with us because we do deserve democracy and freedom. And that reminds me of a, of a quote uh, by a Seaman Wiedenthal, uh, the famous Nazi hunter, uh, may rest in peace, that uh, he had this meeting with Jimmy Carter um, to talk about his work. This was back in 1980, I think. And he told them that there was no denying that Hitler and Stalin, if they were alive today, they would be waiting for their community to forget because this is what makes it possible for the resurrection of people like that, for people to forget. And the work you do, and it's, a, it's universal, this goes beyond any, uh, any one nation, any one person. If you let evil uh, get away with it and you ignore it and you don't face it, it comes back. It's like a weed. It's not going to stop coming back. So the fact that you and your team and your, and your, and your community has been able to bring this uh, struggle here uh, to the United States and sh hold these universities to account. Oberlin College needs to do the right thing, and hopefully they will do the right thing. It, it may take a little bit, uh, but it's going to help, and it, it sends a message to the regime that they're not going to be safe here. They're not going to be able to come and hide here uh, because there's great Americans like you who are turning it and using the law and using peace and using accountability to, uh, to change that behavior. Exactly. And I would like to mention also that Hamid Nuri is the, one of the assistant prosecutors at the time, is now in jail in Sweden, and he's going to be prosecuted in August 10 under the universal jurisdiction for committing crimes against humanity. And my sister that lives in Sweden, she is one of the plaintiffs to, the, to, the, to this case court. And I'll be there on August 10 when the court starts, which is going to be a long one. It's going to take, uh, I think, 90 sessions so far, they think, the prosecutors. Wow. We want to have you, uh, ba so we want to have you back for that. To see. Yeah, that would be interesting court to see. I, I can't say that finally one of them, after 43 years of atrocities, one of the Iranian people is getting uh, being placed in court for that, for these atrocities. Well, if, well, I promise we, we will have you back. Uh, we've been talking to Ladan uh, Barzagan out in California, former political prisoner, human rights activist, human rights defender, patriot. I, I hope you will keep this going. And as always, you have a home here. If you ever need a platform uh, to, to shine, some, so shine some light on our friends here in the States, please let us know. We'd be glad to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you and your listener as well. Thank you. The views and opinions expressed by hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the views of the Global Liberty Alliance, its network, sponsors, donors, or broadcast platforms. The Global Liberty Alliance provides this podcast for informational purposes. Freedom of speech is a fundamental right and essential for free societies to prosper. Thank you for listening and supporting the mission of the Global Liberty Alliance dedicated to strengthening and defending fundamental individual rights, free markets, and the rule of law. Hello, fellow Liberty Warriors. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way uh, to make a podcast. It's free uh, for starters. There's also uh, an awesome creation tool. If you don't want to hire a producer right away, you can record and edit your podcast right from your phone, right from your computer, anywhere you are, at any time. It uh, distributes for you, so that's really important. Once you record this, you need to get it to the right platform. They will do that for you, including on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many, many more. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast. It's all in one place. It's very easy to use. So give Anchor a try. Download the free Anchor app 
or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm to get started.